Ash? Oh, come to order. It was uh, in a Sunday school class <clears throat> that the teacher had just finished teaching about the children of Israel and all that they had been doing. And it was time for questions and answers. And one of the little boys raised his hand for a question. And he said, uh, teacher, uh, did the children, it was the children of Israel that went across the Red Sea? Yes. And it was the children of Israel that uh, fought the Philistines? Yes. And it was the children of Israel that uh, went out into the desert and stayed 40 years? Yes. And the children of Israel built the tabernacle? Yes. He said, what's your question? So what did the adults do all this time? <laughs> oh, boy. I was just thinking about taking the offering here. There was uh, two men that were marooned ship had wrecked. They were the only two survivors, and they came to a desert island, and there they were. Nobody was there. One of them was a believer. The other one was not. The unbeliever was frustrated and screaming, we're never going to get off this island. What are we going to do? How are we going to make it? And the believer is just laying down by the palm tree, just back, crossing his arms, arms in front of him, just kind of enjoying. He said, what are you doing? We're, we're going to... He said, I'm not at all worried. He said, why not? He said, well... I make a ten, I can make $100,000 a week, and I tithe to my church, and my pastor will find me. <laughs> and that's found right here in, on, on that paper. It's nothing to do with the Bible at all. There was a uh, young man who had finished Bible college. He had finished seminary. He was ready to go to the mission field. In fact, he had raised his funds and had been accepted by a mission board. And uh, he was going to go and he was to get a, go on a plane in Chicago. And uh, he did. It was to change planes in Fort Lauderdale. And so when he got to Fort Lauderdale, he got off of the plane and he had about and 45 minutes before the uh, next plane would go. So he sat down and thought he would write his mom a letter, just a note, tell him where he was and what was going on. So he took an envelope that he had had in his pocket and actually stamped with her name on it and uh, had a, got out his pen, but he couldn't find a piece of paper to write on, so he grabbed a newspaper and wrote in the, in the margins, and he said, Mom, I'm in Fort Lauderdale, and we'll be leaving in about half an hour, and uh, we'll let you know when we get there. Put it in the envelope, mailed it and uh, got on a plane, and within an hour and a half on the plane, it crashed into the side of a mountain and everybody was killed. <clears throat> Two days later, his mother got this letter. She had heard the news on the radio, and she reads it, and it was just suffering inside, and then she just turned the piece of paper over, which where the note was, and on the other side was one word, why? Why? I suspect every one of us have asked that question, why? For some reason or other. Why, why, why? Today I want to talk to you a little bit about why saints suffer. If you were a, an angel and could see the different spiritual conditions of people, and you would walk into a hospital room and you would see two people lying in bed, both of them with terminal cancer, you would see one thing. But if you were a, a dog, you walked in and saw that, all you would see are just two people. Same people, same thing going to happen. But if you were the angel and knew the spiritual condition, and one, you realized that one of them was a believer and one of them was not, you'd realize that on this side, the unbeliever, it's the devil doing whatever he wants to do with his. his. But on the other side, it's God allowing something in the life of the believer for a purpose. And today I want to talk to you about why saints, S-A-I-N-T-S, saints, suffer. And if you know Christ as Savior, the Bible tells us you're a saint. You don't have to be canonized. The minute you know Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and you become a saint. If you find that hard to believe, well, read the book of 1 Corinthians and then read the whole book and you'll realize that even the Corinthians were called saints. 
And they were probably the worst church that Paul had to deal with. But they're saints of God. So saints then suffer. And they suffer in all kinds of ways. It could be physical. could be emotional. could be financial. It could be relational. It could be the fact that you have a sibling that's, uh, that is a brother of yours, but you have nothing to do with him because something was said many years ago and, and you just can't get over it. There may be those who have children who are prodigals. They've walked away from the faith. You raise them in church and they're on drugs and they're in, a, in, in and out of, the, of jail and rehab and nothing happening in their lives and you're suffering about that. Or maybe you have a disease that is just plaguing you and you can't seem to get any relief from it. Or maybe just pain, arthritis or rheumatitis or bursitis. They say those itis boys are the worst and Arthur is the worst of them all. Be that as it may, whatever you may be suffering, whether it's pain, physical or something, Every one of us has suffered. We're all going to die, and probably through some sickness, unless it's an accident, then that's bad. So we're going to die, and we're going to suffer. But why? Well, this morning I'd like for you to think that. I'm going to give you four reasons that I believe the Bible tells us that saints suffer. And they all start with the letter C. The first one is, we suffer because... God is correcting us, correcting us. Secondly, God is constructing us, another C. Thirdly, God is convincing the angels, demons, the devil about people that love him or just the fact they love him. And fourth, he, we comfort. he comforts us and we comfort others. So let's look at them. The first one I want you to note, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. In that chapter, one of the things about it is it talks about the fact that God chastens his people. That are, they are his people, children of his own. Listen to what it says in chapter 12, and it begins in verse 5. It says this. Hebrews 12, 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? Here's the exhortation. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. For if, for, if it is for discipline that you endure, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we have earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness." God disciplines, chastens, corrects, makes his children sometimes suffer to correct them. If you're a believer and you are, you are walking in sin and you know it, you, 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 there's, there's a sin in your life that God has, has spoken to you about and you continue in that sin, God will chasten you. He'll, 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 he'll start, sometimes Hosea mentions in chapter 4 of his book, he said he'd start, he's talking about Ephraim, the, the, the uh, tribe of Ephraim. He said in Ephraim, Ephraim, they were disciplined by God and God dealt with them like the brush of a moth wing. That might be just a twinge in your conscience that you're doing something wrong. But they continued in it and did not respond. And in, by, later on in that same chapter, it says he came upon them like a lion's roar. So it may be that if you are a sinner, a day, a Christian, you know you've sinned, 
You know you're living in it. You're walking in a path that is not God's path. God will discipline you. And if he doesn't discipline you, then the Bible says you're illegitimate children. Because God will, the Bible says, discipline his own children. We lived in a neighborhood that had three boys in our house and four in the table people next door. And I never spanked the kids next door. Loved to it many times, but never did. But it did ours. Why? I couldn't discipline them. They weren't my kids. But my kids, I could. And the Bible says we should. And God says sometimes we, men, do it for our own good pleasure. Made us feel better. You say, tell the kids it hurts me more than it does you. They don't believe that. And the scriptures say here that God disciplines for a moment and it seems good to human parents. But God does not do that for making him feel better. He does it so that we will get back on the track and be under his blessing. So one of the reasons that saints suffer, and it could be physical, and by the way, you remember 1 Corinthians chapter 11 speaking about communion? Talking in that text, they're talking about this, not discerning the body of the Lord when you come to take communion. And the Bible says, for many have not done this, and many in your congregation, he said, are weak, and some are sick, and some have prematurely died because they knew that they were not doing the right thing, and they didn't change, and God finally took them home. But some were sick, and some were weak. So one of the things that God does when you're out of the will of God, you know you're out of the will of God, he speaks to you, you don't do it, he makes you, quote, unquote, suffer, chastening you to bring you back into the path. And the Bible says the purpose of it is right here. All discipline for a moment. No, he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness and walk with him. All discipline for a moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet for those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So the first reason we say is that God disciplines or, or makes a saint suffer, saints suffer because God is trying to correct them, or you or me or whoever it is. The second is that God is trying to construct us. You know, when God saves people, he saves a lot of rough material. I mean, they don't have people get saved. They have no background whatsoever of what the Christian life is about. They just come to Christ. I can remember specifically being at the mission when the first God saved you to go down the mission on a regular basis to preach. And preach one service, one guy came forward, and he was smelly, and, and I, oh, man, he looked bad and all that stuff. Grabbed my hand and said, man, that was a hell of a sermon. Well, I had just quit saying those kind of words, you know, and, and it just struck me. But that was his background. He had nothing to, he, listen, this man was rough, as were we. And God wants to construct us because the Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 8, you remember, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And his purpose is that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. God wants to conform us into the image of Jesus. And the Bible tells us when we see him, we're going to be like him. But we don't want the transformation to be so radical that we hardly would know it. We want to be more like Jesus, so it's just kind of ease into being like him. We want to be constructed and transformed to the image of Christ. They asked a sculpture one day, they said, they brought a big, big hunk of marble, the kids were standing around it, just looking at it, and, these, and the, the, the sculptor was there, was pondering and looking at it, just a block. And they said, well, what are you going to do with that? He said, well, he said, I'm going to make a, a, a statue out of that. And the little kid said, well, how do you do it? He said, well, I study it for a long period of time, and I see the statue in my mind, and then I chip away everything from that marble that doesn't look like it. And that's what God does in our lives, constructing us to make us like Christ. And when we're rough stuff, you see, we, have, we, we just have habits and things that we do that we don't even know we're wrong. They may be sin, but they may not, but in our mind, we didn't, we didn't think so. 
And God just had to chip away at it and chip away at it and chip away at it. <coughs> Some time ago, <coughs> I was playing golf with a guy and uh, playing at golf with a guy and uh, he was using bad language. And I said to him, uh, you know, you are a believer. Yes, absolutely. Well, why do you use the language? I don't know. Never thought about it. And God began to chip away at that and chip away and chip away till finally he wasn't using it. You see, that's what God. So where are those rough spots in your life and mine? God just chips them away. You say, well, I don't have any patience. Well, that's true. And the Bible tells us God will bring tribulation into your life so that you'll work patience. You see, God is like a that, that sculptor who will just chip away and chip away and chip away until finally it's all done. It's an interesting verse of scripture in the book of Hosea, chapter 49, but you don't have to turn to it. It says this, we are like arrows in his quiver. Now, what is an arrow? Well, an arrow is used to, to hunt in that day. And if you would take perhaps one of those arrows, which would be wooden, it would be rather rough. But today, arrows today are made of steel. And if you take them and look at them, they look absolutely perfect. They're just as smooth as silk. But they tell me that if you put that under a, micro, under a, teles, a microscope or a telescope and you look at it, you will find that it's thousands and millions of little, little chintz facets where the sandpaper and where the file has just chipped off, chipped off, until finally it looks to us smooth and can be used in the hunt. So what God does is he just chips away, chips away, chips away until we are more like Jesus. And when we feel that happening, we want to just yield to it and allow him to take it away. So one reason a person suffers, since saints suffer, is that God is correcting them, bringing you back on the path. You know you're sinning. You're walking away from God. God brushes you with a moth wing. You don't respond. It gets a little more severe. You don't respond. Possibly, possibly, God takes you just out of the picture. But then there is the correcting one. You don't even know that sin or just habits and, and ways that you brought with you when you came into the Christian life. God just chips them away. And it's a little suffering and it hurts. But nonetheless, it happens. Thirdly, God makes people, Christians, suffer because God uses them to convince the devil, the demons, the angels in heaven, the unseen hosts, that there are people on this earth that love him no matter what happens. Turn with me to the book of Job, if you will. Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, okay? Now, in the book of Job, we have a classic example of this, where in the book of Job, chapter 1, we get a, a picture of who he is. And wouldn't you like to have this putting on your tombstone as an epitaph? Listen to what it says in Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Listen, that man was blameless. He was upright. He feared God and turned away from evil. And then it tells what, his, what he had. Seven sons, three daughters. His, he 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 10, 000, uh, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys of very many of servants, the man was the greatest of all the men in the East. And then the Bible said that his sons had, were having, they have their daughters, their sons and daughters are having a party in their house. And one day, the Bible tells us that the sons of God, that's all the, well, the devil, would, the devil was among them, had to come to God. You see, God is still in charge. He's given the devil, the, let him be the God of this age and the prince of the power of the air right now kind of like a devil on a, on a long leash, but he's got him. He can only go so far. And it was a day they were called before God, the Bible says, and they stood before the Lord, and Satan came among them. And God initiates a conflict, if you will, in the life of Job. The Lord said to Satan, where did you come from? I went going from, I'm roaming up around the earth, walking in it. And then right off the bat, God said, have you considered my servant Job? 
Now, Job had never read the book of Job. He didn't know what was going on. He's just down here enjoying life and, and taking care of his family and, and enjoying what he had and what God was doing for him. But all of a sudden, God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says to him, remember here when Satan said, <clears throat> well, uh, does Job fear you for nothing? You made a hedge about him in his house and all his hands on every side. You blessed him with all the work of his hands and his possessions. You've increased his land. <laughs> but you put forth his hand now and just touch all he has. He'll curse you to his face. God said, go ahead. I'll lower the hedge and you can go in and touch anything he has. Anything. But don't touch him. And it wasn't but, I'll bet you, very, very shortly that everything he had was gone. Notice what it says. The sons and daughters, the Bible said, in verse 13, they were eating, drinking, and a messenger came and said, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys feeding, Sabaeans came, attacked them, they alone slew all your servants at the edge of the sword, I alone have escaped to tell you. Everything they had, every one servant would be left alive to come and tell him the problem. You lost all your camels, you lost all your goats, you lost all your donkeys, you lost all your sheep, they're all gone. And... A fire came down, and your house went, and your sons and daughters died. Everything you have is gone. Everything. And Job, according to Satan, Job was supposed to curse God. But know what it says. Verse 20. Job rose, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, he fell to the ground, and he worshipped. Was it sin in Job's life? Well, his friends tried to say that was it. But it was just God had originated. Here's a trust. I want to just show you there are people there that love me and will serve me no matter what. But that wasn't enough. Job, you remember, it goes back. The Bible tells us in the second chapter, another day when they all came before the Lord. And God said, how about Job? <laughs> how about this man? Did you see him? Yeah. But uh, skin for skin, he said, you, you touch his body. And he'll, he'll curse you and die. That's right. God said, oh, the hedge is down a little lower. You can do anything you want to him with his body, but you can't kill him. He can't die. Satan went out and smote him with boils from top to bottom, head to toe. If you ever had one boil, that's bad enough. But to be split with head boils from top to bottom, head to toe, and he's out on a, on a heap of dust and, and ashes, scraping the pus and his boils from his arms, and his friends come to see him. And you remember what happened. His wife comes now and says, you're a miserable man. I just curse God and die. So he loses his wife. He loses his kids. He loses everything he has, and now his health is gone, and he has nothing, and he's sitting on an ash heap, and he has miserable friends that come and try to comfort him. All of that was to show, what did Job say? God has given, God takes away, and he worshipped the Lord even in that. So sometimes, God may pick you. you don't, you're not walking away from God. You're living as close to him as you possibly can. You're doing everything you know. You're loving the Lord, and he may choose you to suffer just to show the devil and the angel who you are. What a privilege to think that God would do that for you. So sometimes saints suffer because they're sinning against God. And the only reason you, what you do is that you confess that sin and get right with God, and God will just put his arms around you and take you home. Interesting, just that reminds me that we were, I was listening to something on the radio and, <clears throat> or television, I can't remember, Anyhow, Ruth Graham, who was Billy Graham's daughter, was one of the prodigal daughters. And she had been, I don't know, married three times. And her, one of her children had kids out of wedlock. And she was, oh, just as gone far. Scared to death of what her parents would say, but had to go home. And she went home, and she's coming up the path, and she sees Billy, her dad, this great evangelist, coming down the walk toward her. And all first he sees her, he puts his arms around her and says, welcome home. Almost brought tears in my eyes. Welcome home. That's exactly what God will do for you. 
You sinned against God. I did it awful. And God said, welcome home. But he might want to construct you. A lot of stuff, rough, rough stuff in your life that just still isn't like Christ, and he's transforming you into an image of Jesus. And all things are working together for good. Doesn't mean they're all good, but they're working together for good and transforming you into that image. But it might be that you can't, there's not, all God has done is just said to the Satan, have you considered Mary? Have you considered Jim? And Satan said, you just, all he's done for you, you go for Go ahead, go ahead. Here, I'm lowering the hedge. God, Satan comes in and tries it, but you make it. And God is glorified. Satan gets another mouthful of dust. And God says, I love you. But one other thing, and with this one very quickly, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. And he's writing about the business. This book is about him, really. They're attacking him, and he's kind of just kind of apologizing for who he is. But listen to what it says in verse 2. To the grace, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, and with all the saints who are throughout Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Now listen to verse 4. For who, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the same comfort with which ourselves are comforted by God. Have you ever thought about that? That maybe the affliction that you have, the suffering that you're going through or have gone through, is going to be so helpful to somebody else. And when you saw what God did for you in it, you can comfort them. And that's what the text is saying here. That God says that he can comfort you. And so you can comfort somebody else. It's one thing to say to a person who loses a boy in the service, I know what you're going through and you haven't lost a boy in the service. But it's something else if you have lost one and they say to you, I've lost a son. You can say, here's what God did for me. And I know exactly what you're going through. And you can comfort them. Or if a person has had cancer and it's, 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 it's going, it's not, not doing well. You say, I know what you're going through. You've never had cancer. You don't know what they're going through. But if you do, you can comfort them with the same comfort that God has comforted you. So why do saints suffer? Well, I think four reasons. Number one, he is correcting us. He wants us to get back on the path. We're walking. God has a will for our life. Get out of the will of God. Keep walking that way. And God is going to make you suffer. If he doesn't, but you're probably, he says, I, I only do that to my sons. Only the people I love. Only but my people. But I bring them back. Or it may be that he's just correct, he's constructing you. There's a lot of rough stuff you brought into the Christian life. You may not even know it, but you notice that there's something wrong here and all of a sudden it's a little suffering here and there and you realize that he's chipping away and taking away some of that stuff that you kind of enjoyed. Or it may be that he's making you a, a convincing heaven that there are people on this earth that love God. They don't care what happens to them or anything they have. They love God anyway with all their hearts. Or you might, God is letting you suffer so that you can comfort somebody else who has a great need. Where are you? And remember, the Bible says, saints. The devil's people, sometimes it looks like they never suffer. But that's, they will. But the God's people suffer for, I think, those four reasons. And there may be others. Let's pause for prayer. Father God, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for your word. <laughs> Help us today to simply receive that which you said. Speak to our hearts. If we're suffering today, Lord, it's not unusual as a believer. Every believer is going to suffer something sometime, somewhere. But help us to check our lives and see what's going on and why and handle it. 
and thank you for your, the fact that you're using that somehow to make us more like Jesus. So thank you for hearing us. Bless us as we conclude the service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.